STEM subjects underpin a very wide variety of jobs and professions. So we asked five people who've excelled in their field to tell us just how they used STEM skills in their lives and the importance of these skills for young people today. Well, my name is Virginia Acha. I work at Pfizer as a government affairs manager and I look after innovation policy in the UK. I'm the education editor, Helen Joyce. Um, I have been working here for nearly four years. Uh, first as education correspondent and now as education editor. My name is Sunan Prasad. I'm the current president of the Royal Institute of British Architects and I'm also a senior partner in a practice of Penoy and Prasad, LLP. My name's Carlton Reeve. I'm an executive producer with Illumina Digital. It's a multi-platform agency based in London and we produce materials for BBC, Channel 4, museums and galleries. I'm squadron leader Glyn Dean. I'm in the Royal Air Force and currently I work at what we call the Directorate of Recruitment and Initial Training at Royal Air Force Cranwell. I think it would actually be very difficult for me to separate out my activities um, to say which ones explicitly use scientific or maths understanding, because I think they all do. I think perhaps because I've got a scientific background, I'm more aware of that being the case. But actually, whether it's designing a budget or organising a schedule and working out a critical path where all the dependencies are, are in place to make sure that we hit a deadline, that uses all sorts of scientific planning that I've learned earlier in my career. The sort of skills that are useful in my job, the, the job I'm currently doing, are most definitely analytical still, skills and a certain amount of managing information. Um, numeracy is always extremely important and at this moment in time I have responsibility for a reasonably sized budget. Well the two skills that I think I use most often that I can really definitely attribute to my mathematical education are logical argument and probabilistic argument. So logical argument is A, therefore B, therefore C, therefore D. And The Economist writes very concise and condensed articles that take in a lot of evidence and do usually come to a conclusion, they're usually presenting an argument. And you know, I, I structure my articles in a way that you might structure a proof. I'm aware of doing this every week. And the probabilistic arguments, well, if you, if you look at the sort of content that's in a magazine like The Economist that covers politics and economics and finance and so on, a lot of it comes from things like opinion polls or surveys or large statistical databases and so on. So very many weeks what I'm doing is I'm presenting uh, statistical research to a general audience. Understanding causation in life is pretty important. It's a very fundamental life skill. Again, it's something that STEM subjects develop because, first of all, you have to want to understand the cause. One of the interesting things about STEM subjects isn't just the skill, it's the attitude that it inculcates in you because you can see through studying those subjects the powerful impact of understanding causation because it, what it does is it increases your own ability to prevail and to, if you like, get things your way or at least understand what is happening. Most people assume that if you do STEM skills you're working in a lab, you're working, so we do have a very large R&D laboratory, you know, Europe's largest R&D site and they certainly are um, a tremendous source of our STEM skills in the company. But I think most people would be surprised how many of our guys that work in commercial sides, they're also STEM graduates. So most of the colleagues that I have who work in communications have a science background. We live in a, a very complex world and actually an increasingly complex world. So if you're thinking of someone who's starting their career now and they're going to be working for maybe 40 years, they're, that, they're going to be dealing with enormous amounts of data from different sources and the world is going to be changing around them as they're doing that. So you need somebody who is able to, uh, to deal with numbers and to deal with large amounts of data and able to deal with logic and argument and structure and they're going to have to do that in a way that develops and builds on itself as their career and the world changes. So it's not enough if somebody's got just great presentation skills or good personality, important that those things are. You need to have somebody as well who's got a sound foundation for logic and for numeracy, of course, you know, very, very fundamental skill, so that they can develop as a person and also they can, as the world develops, they can work with it. We've just actually recruited someone and the skill sets that, that really sold this individual uh, were their ability to really look around the problem from a variety of perspectives 
and to be able to order those and to say which, which of these matter the most, uh, which of these are less important, and which of these really need further work. It's not particularly fashionable to say it, but there are a lot of degree courses that are fairly woolly, are fairly um, unclear about their objectives. And because there is often a stigma about maths and science, they tend to dilute that aspect of it. So whenever I'm looking at uh, job applicants, I always look to see what level of achievement they've got in those areas. Because although they can be challenging as subjects sometimes, the ability to master those disciplines is critical. It, it demonstrates so many secondary characteristics. It's not just about um, critical thinking, it's not just about logic, it's about perseverance and diligence. The Royal Air Force does have a large requirement every year for young people who have a, uh, a, a basic level of numeracy and who have, uh, into, in, if we were recruiting them into our technical trades, then they need also to have a science qualification. Um, to be an officer in the RAF, then you must have GCSE maths. So we've always seen mathematics and science as being particularly important. It's quite hard to be a, a really good architect without being interested in people. You can be a nerd, and that's perfectly allowable, or a geek, and you can be a techno freak. Uh, I'm a, quite a toy boy myself, I love new things. Uh, but you have to relate them to people's use. Uh, and even the moments that you forget people exist, you have to come back and bring it back at some point in a rigorous way to test whether they are okay for people. So actually the test is a very important thing and again it links very strongly to STEM subjects because the idea of a hypothesis and then testing it rigorously, i.e. letting the imagination flow but also being able to test it, is a very particular skill that architects need to have. I think that children who have got the STEM qualifications, who have learned to manage information, who've learned to analyse problems and solve problems using those skills, will be in the highest demand in the future. I think life is, it sounds terribly cliché, but I think life is one big experiment. We just keep trying new things and sometimes they work and sometimes they fail. And if we've got anything about us, then we try and make it better next time. And I think the scientific principles that we learn in science and maths about creating experiment, looking for evidence, evaluating that evidence, reframing the initial test and trying to improve it, they're explicit within the scientific disciplines, but actually they are the core of learning. And whether you learn them in science or, or elsewhere, they're the things that help us in our lives develop. It's about new experiences, it's about thinking about those experiences getting new ideas about them and testing them elsewhere. And those scientific principles are absolutely critical, irrespective of whether it's in science or in general life. I think that actually there is a discipline inherent in studying STEM subjects. Some of the concepts are quite complicated. And I think it does teach children these quite important analysis and problem solving techniques that they can use in virtually any scenario in life. I think when you study STEM subjects, you're not just taught the content, you're taught a way of thinking. This is sort of uh, an approach to the world that says, we base things on evidence and we base things on rigor and we go through a process of understanding that we can all agree on as, as a logical and, and acceptable way forward. Well, there's a sort of generic thing you're going to have to do in life that's both in work and at home, and that's make decisions. And when you're making decisions, you need to gather an enormous amount of data, and you need to deal with that in a structured and logical way, and you need to, you need to balance maybe you know, multiple uh, downsides and upsides against each other, and you need to make a decision and go ahead and do it. I think learning mathematics and science and those kinds of subjects at school is about learning the tools that will help you through life by showing you how reason works, how to argue a point, how to understand a point, how to analyse and communicate, in fact. I think when you teach maths, you're teaching something that gives people what they need to move on to the future. And you can't exactly say which bit. 
Like if you look at the technologies now and the things that use mathematicians now, from the city to you know software firms, um, you know computing, all these big industries that didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago that look very different. Well, those were kids who were in primary school who are working in those now. But the maths they learned has helped them so much still. It's it's great actually to be teaching something that is so changeless, and you know you're, you're giving people the passport they need for the future. There is nothing else like that kind of powerful rational base that you can develop through studying STEM subjects. So journalism is going to move much more onto the internet. Our own website is being beefed up. We're expected to, to blog and to write articles online and to do news analysis which comes out daily rather than weekly like The Economist. And that's surely the way my profession is going to go. I mean, worldwide, I mean, you know, the big story in the next 20 years is going to be China, India, science, technology. I'm not saying anything very original there, I hear it all the time. There is a theorist in, at Harvard Business School, a management scientist by the name of Dorothy Leonard, who talks about the T-shaped person. This is someone who has uh, a certain depth in a, in a particular field of study, that's the, the long bit of the T, but who has enough grounding to make them able to deal with interdisciplinary boundaries. So being able to talk across science or maths or engineering, but also arts and humanities. And so you can speak across a range of, um, of issues, a range of factors, because it's very difficult to imagine a future where you, won't, you will not have that bound together. I think we're going to face a very interesting future. It's increasingly clear that it's going to be digital, it's going to be online, and it's going to be much more varied than anything in the past because the ability to produce new content is becoming much more widespread. It's not restricted to factories anymore. Anyone can produce it. But there's interesting um, research that says that although the so-called Google generation is much more familiar and at ease with using new technologies, they don't necessarily know how to use them most effectively. The more you understand about, okay, well I know a little bit about how the maths work, I know a little bit about how the science works, I know about how people behave, you can come to a much better solution um, for yourself, for your family, for your community, but you need to have that sort of holistic understanding of some of these very big challenges. And it's not a single discipline that's going to answer them. Um, you need to have an understanding across those different skills to be able to make that well-rounded decision. Um, and that's something that we should be teaching kids from, from day one. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at a problem and you probably need to look at more than one way. We need to be doing something proactive with young people to try and explain to them that actually to get the very best out of their lives they need to keep their options as wide as possible and that by turning your faces away, if you will, from science and maths, then unwittingly you can narrow your options. I think scientific principles will become increasingly important in the future because increasingly people will be working on their own initiative and they'll need to be able to do so in an educated and structured way. So they are going to be left to their own devices in order to come up with solutions. And unless people have a sense of, okay, what's my idea? How do I test that idea? How do I determine whether it's working or not? And if it's not working, how do I improve that? Those processes aren't just scientific, they're the basis for how we learn. And so those sort of core ideas and our ability to continually learn throughout life will be absolutely essential in, in the future employment markets. I also think that increasingly it isn't going to be just about lifting out a box that doesn't work and putting a box in. There's going to be an increasing requirement for young employees to learn how these things actually work. To survive and prosper as an individual, the kind of foundations that STEM subjects build are in, invaluable to my mind, are great aid to both, both prospering and surviving.